All right, welcome in. This is the Thursday deep dive episode. We have Ian Gray with us. As always, we're going to be talking carparts.com. We're recording this about six days ahead of time. So if some of the numbers are a little bit off, uh, just fair warning, we're doing this early. And we're doing that because Ian is heading off to an internship uh, going big time on us, heading over mm-hmm. to an investment bank in San Francisco, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Ian, are you ready for that? Uh, you're going to hit the big time now at the big investment bank? <laughs> yep, looking forward to it. I I enjoy kicking back with you guys on the podcast and researching stocks, but going to go get a taste of a little something different this summer. Yeah, yeah. No, we're the same. We're, we're, uh, we have the same intensity as, as an investment bank now. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think it's a little, a little different, but uh, Ryan, I'll have you introduce carparts.com. But first, we have to talk about seven investing. Who wants to go, me or you? Talk you got it this time. Okay, so. Use our promo code CCM at checkout to get $10 off our first month. We'll put the link in the show notes as well. If you just want to use that, uh, that takes the $17 a month down to seven bucks a month. And if you want to do the annual subscription, which I believe is $170, takes that down to 160 bucks, gets access to all their picks. There's seven each month, as you can tell. Which is already, the yearly is already a discount. Yearly is, yeah, it's already a so discount as well. So it's a double discount. No, double welcome. discount with that, yeah. If you go in for the year, seven picks each month from a wide range of analysts, and they keep you updated on their picks. They're always communicating with you. It's we just great read, we read that one update. Yeah. That was help. relevant to us for reasons that I can't say. Yeah, we don't want to spoil what their picks are or anything, but, but they're exciting. Yeah, I mean, they're not just throwing out the picks, telling you to buy it. They're telling you why. They're updating you on the progress of the company, all that good stuff. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's get, get started. To the, yeah, let's get to the show. Ryan, do you want to talk about carparts.com? Yeah, so they're an e-commerce company that delivers a range of, you guessed it, uh, car parts. So, uh, and they, they go direct to consumer. That's the thing they tout, but they also have wholesale distribution partners. Um, and they tout more than 800,000 different stock keeping units. Um, so basically just different parts. Um, and then the majority of their items are sourced in Southeast Asia. I think they have some, they, they do some sourcing in America, but I believe most of it comes from Southeast Asia and then it's shipped out to America. And then they have three different types of items that they're pretty much selling. So they have replacement parts, hard parts, and performance parts. The replacement ones are basically the exterior of an automobile. So think like, if there's damage or there's wear and tear, you can order that part to have it replaced uh, through there. And then there's the hard parts. That's more like engine components, uh, more mechanical and technical type stuff. And then performance is more designed. Uh, I imagine this is more for like car junkies. You're trying to improve the performance of the car. Um, but then they they fulfill orders in one of two ways. They stock and ship, which is where they take delivery of it into their distribution center and then there's drop ship which is where merchandise is shipped directly from the suppliers to the customers um am i missing anything or do you kind of get the gist of it yeah i, I mean they got some new initiative we'll probably talk in about future growth opportunities but yeah i think that's it okay yeah i mean it's really not a super difficult model uh but i'll get into the history car parts has actually been in business for more than 20 years they recently changed their name but used to be known as u.s auto parts network and the company was founded in 1995 by Sol Kazani and Maran Nia, uh, initially incorporated in California. I think their headquarters are still there. And Maran Nia was the CEO, I think, until 2019. Uh, and he's still on the board, uh, but uh, there has been a CEO change, which I'll, I think we'll mention later. But uh, the company first built a website in 1999. They went public initially, I believe, in 2007. Um, but in 2019, they've kind of done this revamp of the whole business model. They brought in new management. Uh, the new CEO is Lev Peeker, Pecker? Pecker, I think. Okay. P-E-K-E-R, we're spelling it. <laughs> yeah, Don't wanna, yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're, kind of, they're trying to reinvent themselves. They've hired a bunch of employees. Uh, they're growing much faster than they used to, and they're starting to expand distribution capacity. So they're really trying to become a one, like, more of a digital model and that that's really what they're branding themselves as as well uh i think they're it will take longer 
to evolve to like a digital only because they're still going to have the wholesale distribution partners and stuff like that. But that's sort of the narrative they're going for now. Yeah, big time turnaround story here. If you look at the stock chart, huge turnaround. The I think they had sales declines right before this new management team took over, but we'll, I bet we'll talk about that later as well. Uh, I'll hit industry quick. So total US aftermarket for auto parts is about $280 billion. So large and I mean, I think that makes sense, but you might not think it's as large initially so it is quite big and cardspark.com is playing a subset of that like for example they're probably not doing tires or some of the other things within the aftermarket so they're not going after that total 280 billion dollars but at their size i mean that's not really anything to worry about you're not concerned at all about market saturation i'd say their biggest competitors include autozone o'reilly and then local mechanic shops that sell parts and then there's also pet boys who is a bit smaller. And then for example, I'll just give an example of how much, how many sales, or sorry, excuse me, how much sales, I can't say this, how much revenue AutoZone does each year. They did about $13.4 billion in the last 12 months. And then used car sales in the US to kind of give a trend of where the industry is moving. Used car sales have actually trended up over time while new car sales have trended down. So there's only 14 million sold in 2020. The, and that was a lot, farther down than it was in 2010 that might have been a COVID hiccup but you know with used car sales growing and new car sales declining that could provide an industry tailwind you know a small one for someone like carparts.com and cars are lasting longer too sure so. yeah i think they they mentioned in all their conference calls it's ticked up to about 11.9 years is the average age of a car on the road that should be a benefit for companies like carparts.com as well um, i'll kick it over to you if you want to talk management yep so as Ryan mentioned, Lev Park, or sorry, Parker, Lev Pecker is the current CEO. He was hired in uh, 2019, as we talked about, to enact a turnaround of the company. Um, he actually worked for the company from 2008 to 2014 as well in a variety of roles, both in their finance office and uh, in their sales department, I believe. Um, but as part of that, basically an entirely new management team was brought with him in 2019 and, and they were still hiring some people into 2020. And um, so it's it's a completely new management team has some experience in the company but so far they've been doing some pretty impressive things so in 2019 when he took over the stock was about a dollar a share today it sits at almost 15 15 or it's at 15.67 as we're recording today so um a pretty pretty impressive stock return in just two short years um that's coming on the tail of um basically flat revenue growth from before he was there and even some a little bit of revenue decline to 58% uh, growth in 2020, uh, 2020 and 71% revenue growth in the last 12 months. So, so far, it seems like they're doing a pretty good job. They've caught some COVID tailwinds here, but it, it's the fairly early innings of a turnaround story, hopefully. Um, as far as Lev goes, I, I like listening to his interviews. He seems like a grounded guy, um, doesn't shoot too high with expectations. Um, one, one question he got was on CNBC was something along the lines of is car parts, uh, dot com the next, or the Amazon of car parts was basically the question, which is a little bit of a silly question, but his response to that was who wouldn't want to be the Amazon of anything, but we're just focused on building a great business. So, you know, I think he kind of. I like it. He, I uh, read the conference called transcript. He seems like a straight shooter. He's not going to like beat around the bush on any of these stupid metrics. He's just going to be like, all right, we're going to do this. He usually mentions like three things of their initiatives. It's like a one paragraph response, maybe a few sentences. Keeps it simple. And I like that. Yeah, exactly. He seems, like you said, a straight shooter. Um, he owns about 4% of the shares outstanding. Um, he made about $2 billion, or not $2 billion, $2 million in 2020, which seemed a little bit high. Um, a lot of that was stock-based compensation as they hit a lot of performance goals. But, um, you know, it, it, these, are, these executives are being paid fairly well, but not, not insanely high. Um, there's about 18% short interest. So a fairly high short interest, especially on a stock that's done as well as it has in the last, um, the last year, two years. Um, and then also fairly high institutional ownership for a stock of this size, about 75% institutional ownership um, at just an, at a fairly low market cap. Yeah, that short interest as a long term, like, or as a long only investor, if you're just going to buy the stock, that ne doesn't necessarily mean anything different about the business, but it can lead to increased like short term volatility if there's any short squeezes or, you know, 
someone short. Oh, there's a lot of short action out there. Yeah. Um, but I'll hit valuation. Uh, market cap from when I looked it up is about $779 million if you use the fully diluted share count. And that is a bit higher than the weighted average share count. So the listed market cap on a lot of these sites is a bit lower than what it actually is. Ticker is PRTS. Enterprise value is going to be slightly less than market cap, but not much of a difference. And they haven't uh, consistently generated profits. So, you know, I don't know how much you want to consider of that excess cash that's like kind of just going to be burned by, you know, by more investments they're making. Uh, price to sales is about 1.56. Price to gross profit about 4.46. No PE or price to cash flow that would really be relevant. They're right around break even right now. I'm sure Ryan will go into more of the margin numbers. And then they have a few million in share options and RSUs outstanding that could dilute shareholders versus about 50 million share counts. So it's not crazy uh, on the future share dilution here. You know, you're looking at definitely going to be at least 2%, possibly around 4% each year if you're looking at uh, all the share options they're granting. Assuming, um, assuming no issuances as well assuming yeah they may issue stock uh they did some last year about five million worth i think it was 4.9 million so and it's yeah, higher now the, and, the, and the stock price is higher now i think that was at 12 dollars. yeah so there, there was the, the 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 dilution there last year that led the share count to go up a lot they converted some preferred stock as well uh but yeah definitely track that with this company um brian you want to hit earnings yeah, they had first quarter revenue of 145 million. That actually grew 65 percent year over year. Gross margin is pretty steady. Uh, it's usually around 34 uh, percent. And then they had a net loss of 2.7 million dollars. Uh, their net loss during the same time last year was a million. So pretty similar, I'd say. And they're they're investing a lot into the business, which we have talked about, uh, including those distribution centers and expanding capacity there. Uh, and then they generated 13 million in operating cash flow from the quarter, which is actually down from a year ago. The trailing 12 month numbers, they had negative 30 million in free cash flow on about 500 million in revenue, and they're unprofitable on a gap basis. Uh, well, there was some inventory, if I'm not mistaken, right? They had a big rise in inventory. It was that 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 was hurting their cash flow, right? Ian, did you, you remember that or no? They yes. did have a rise in inventory in uh, 2020. Okay. Did they? Okay. Yeah. Do you want to hit the balance sheet then? Yeah, that's a perfect lead into the balance sheet. So they've got about $46 million in cash, about uh, $98 million in inventory, which was up um, from uh, like 52, 53 million at the end of 2019. So pretty significant rise, almost almost a 50, or about a 50% gain. Why? Um, I guess, why is that happening? Uh, they're know? just building, there's growing. There's, okay. Yeah. They yeah, build. they're growing and they're they're increasing. They're building these distribution centers, which I know we're going to touch on more later. Um, which they're trying to stock up with inventory um, because they're really focused on on trying to get things out to people within a couple of days. Shipping times are a big thing for them, and so they're trying to yeah. bring that down those shipping times, which requires more distribution centers and more inventory. Um, related to that, they've got about thirty two million dollars in leases, which we're counting as debt, but still a net cash position of about fourteen million dollars. And then related to the inventory, the inventory ratio, turnover ratio actually improved slightly in the last 12 months um, at 4.2 times, um, up from 3.8 times in 2019. So even though they ramped up their inventory, they're actually selling, um, they're selling through their inventory faster now than they were back in 2019. Uh, it's not a perfect comparison because it's, they're different business models, but the, this compares to an inventory uh, turnover ratio of 1.3 times at AutoZone. And so that's basically saying AutoZone's only selling through all the inventory they have on their books once throughout the year, whereas carparts.com is selling through about four times per year, um, which makes sense because of all the stores that AutoZone has and has to keep stocked. Um, but it's, an asset, it's more of an asset light model to that. Um, not a ton of cash, but looks to be a solid balance sheet and shouldn't really present much of a problem for them going forward. Yeah, looking at the balance sheet, there's a potential they may want to raise money in the near future, but it doesn't look like they're going to have to um, unless they really want to grind, like build out a few more distribution centers really quickly or something like that. Um, that's going to do uh, the, do with the first half of the show here. Let's get to the ad break and I'll get back for the second half. Okay. Welcome back in. Next up is going to be product experience. 
Um, anything with you guys? I know we're not, none of us are car guys. I don't think you're a car guy, Ian. So uh, no, no experience buying anything on this website. I have not bought anything on this website, but I will say, um, as I was kind of diving into it a couple of weeks ago, um, there seemed to be just a level of trust here that there weren't on some other websites that there's just, um, yeah, that's what I saw too. Yeah, that, that there, that's a big issue is buying a car part that's actually not truly what you're looking for. Um, and that might be faulty or might not be quality. And a lot of what I was reading was saying that people, people trusted, trusted these guys quite a bit. How did you find this company? I guess there's a quick sidebar because you're the one that, you know, recommended it last week. Yeah, I saw it on um, Twitter uh, a couple months ago and kind of glazed over it, I think. And then someone else DM'd me about it a couple weeks ago, said he was looking at it. Um, and uh, yeah, just that kind of that Twitter thing, lots of flipping over rocks and getting little <laughs> DMs from here or there from different people. but. Yeah, that seems like that happens. That's that's basically everyone's uh, idea <laughs> generation these days. Um, oh, I'll yeah. kick it over to Ryan. So, so, uh, real quick, I'll give a shout out to Patrick for the uh, for getting it on my radar. But, yeah, there you go. It's a fascinating company. Uh, Ryan, anything? Uh, I went on the website. I, I do like that you can sort of search by model, uh, yeah, and smart. they have sort of the product database there of what you might need. Um, that's convenient, but this this isn't catered to people like me. Like even if I procured a part or whatever, I bought one, I wouldn't know what to do with it. So yeah, yeah I think it's meant more for car junkies or people that know, uh, understand the build. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That database is something that can help. Um, yeah, I'll just re reiterate what Ian said. Uh, there are some positive reviews on the consumer affairs website. Not all of them are perfect. I think they still have issues with shipping the right parts. Um, that could have been historical with old management. And then they also had problems with shipping delays and stuff like that, which hopefully as they have this new management team in there, they can fix that. Um, it kind of shows, I think, the moat of Amazon that we underrate uh, with that logistics network in there. Uh, but yeah, there's just some reviews like, for example, this quote, I've never had a concern with them like some of their competitors. So it looks like their brand is slightly better, but it's not bulletproof. There were some complaints on there for sure. Wasn't perfect. All right, let's hit a uh, competitive advantages next. Ian, what are your thoughts on carparts.com? I like their asset light model. Um, as I was touching on in the balance sheet, they hold less inventory than some competitors like AutoZone or O'Reilly's or things that are more um, kind of that brick and mortar type store. They, this is kind of, this has become more of a competitive advantage as shipping times have come way down and it's not crazy to think like a lot of times when you need a car part, you need a car part and you want to go drive to the store and get it and pick it up. Um, but with this, it, it with shipping times coming down to one day, two days, three days, it allows for people to actually buy things online that they used to need more immediate than online would allow them. Um, and so I think this is starting to tilt the balance more towards uh, asset light instead of companies that are super close to the consumer physically, um, like an AutoZone or an O'Reilly's. It's still early to, to know exactly how it's going to play out, but I think that's a bit of a competitive advantage. Right, isn't that makes that, sense. Isn't that a bit of a catch-22, though? Because I, I guess like the, the way to speed up delivery from that point is to hold more inventory in your distribution centers. Uh, or Our inventory is going to come up, yeah. Yeah because you're still procuring those parts, especially in the drop shipping process, let's say from Southeast Asia, it's going to take time. So right. I guess like inventory they said, Yeah, they said there can be a, upwards of a month of a lead time when getting parts. So um, I guess that turn, inventory turnover ratio is kind of a metric to watch, right? Wouldn't you say again for, uh, yeah, definitely. for tracking this one? Um, all right, Ryan, what do you have for yours? Uh, I wasn't, I didn't have any particular big one that stood out. Uh, I guess brand trust is probably a big one. Uh, the, they have an in-house brand that seems to be well-liked, but that's a very, uh, I think that's a small part of their total SKUs. Yeah. I think 50,000 SKUs, I believe is what it was that are considered in-house brands. Yeah. They own like the cool view mirrors. Um, I think yeah. it's less than 10% of sales. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess uh, potentially scale would be an advantage. Uh, the, the, they say that. Uh, with the current expansion and distribution centers, the one that's going on right now, uh, the company will be able to reach 100% of their customers within the U.S. in two days or less. Um, so uh, that would that would be an advantage over, I guess, some other uh, online websites. I mean, that's not an advantage over like an AutoZone, who's pretty close to the consumer in most places. But 
um, I would say overall, they have advantages versus online in the brand trust. And then they have advantages uh, with asset light versus the brick and mortar. Yeah, it's developing for sure. It's not there yet. Um, it's going to take a while before they have any like true, you know, moat built. Uh, it doesn't feel like there's one yet. But, you know, I guess mine's kind of a developing one as well, like that database, getting it right uh, to have the million or so SKUs on there from all the different parts for all the different models. You know, you're mixing electric vehicles in there now, too. Uh, you want to get that right for whatever people are buying. Most people do not understand the intricacies of like knowing, oh, I got this, it's recommended to me. You have no idea if it's right or wrong until you try to put it on. You're like, oh, wow, this is totally wrong. So most of the complaints they had besides like standard shipping stuff, which is what every website has, are just wrong parts. So I think the, having the million SKUs is something that AutoZone cannot really scale up to. And then it's something Amazon or Walmart are not going to be focused on as their number one priority. It's going to be like priority if they ever go after it, priority 30, 50, something like that. So yeah, you, know, you can just, only be someone that's niche that's really doing this well because there are a million different SKUs among all these different models. It is very complicated. And if you can get it right, that's a giant value proposition. Huge time saver uh, for a consumer that needs this. Yeah, I'd say anything that has where you don't know where you're getting it from. So like eBay and stuff like that, they've said they uh, compete with, well, they sell on eBay and Amazon, but yeah. if you're getting it from someone you don't really know or you don't trust, that can be a difficult proposition, uh, especially if it's used because mm -hmm. uh, just dangerous. You're going to get the wrong part or something faulty. Yeah, I wouldn't buy a car part, I don't think even on Amazon because there's a lot of, I, yeah. I, you know, we've all had the trouble, you know, of getting a bad Amazon uh, yeah. uh, supplier. All right, uh, next up is going to be future growth opportunities. Uh, Ian, what do you have for me? I have continued growth in the DIY market. Um, there's there's kind of been an assumption that DIY will slow down coming out of COVID, that a lot of people started doing, working on their cars or doing stuff around their house or things like that because of COVID, because they had extra time, because they're around their house, because they didn't want to interact with other people, um, like a mechanic potentially. But I think it's an interesting story going forward, whether people will continue to do a lot of this DIY stuff and using things like um, even they've even mentioned it on some of their conference calls or interviews that uh, YouTube and people helping um, teach other people how to do work on their cars has actually been a big boon to their business. And so I don't think that's going to slow down. I think there's going to be more and more people, especially as these cars start to age um, and people hold on to their cars for longer that look at it and go, you know, I can probably, I can change this little part on my car and people are going to get better and better about sharing um, experiences online and, and um, videos and content to help people work on their own cars. So I, I think that's going to continue to be a big growth driver for them going forward. Yeah, I think that that, that makes sense. This could be one where um, there's the New York uh, ignorance where like, you're like, oh, how many people are working on their cars on a Wall Street analyst I live in New York City? In reality, there's still, you know, millions of people doing that around around the country. Um, all right, Ryan, what do you have for, for future growth ops? Uh, mine's the opposite of Ian's, which is more the do it for me. So they've talked about this. It's the mobile mechanics. So I believe I'm getting it right. Uh, this is when a mechanic sort of comes with the part, installs it for you. Um, and they compared it to the Netflix model of instead of shipping which might, that might've been a bit of a stretch in my opinion. They, they say internally, they compare it to Netflix where they go straight oh, to the There's still physical stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not all digital. Um, but I, I think that drastically expands the customer pool because there are a lot, myself especially, uh, I would pay to have a mechanic come and do it. And that could replace maybe uh, some of these auto body repair shops. I could probably steal a lot of market or, or share from them. Just partner with them. I think they partner with them too. So, like, oh. you know, you know what I mean? Like if you have, if you know, you're going to get that mechanic, come over to your house, you get all through carparts.com. Yeah. That's that, that to me, uh, I guess I don't have any hard numbers on it, but that is a much bigger customer pool than the do it yourself. group. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you're right. There's no need, there's no, you don't need to put any numbers on it. It's drastically bigger. Like you said. And, um, what was I going to say? That's probably the most exciting part of the business that I read to be like uh, of, of anything. Yeah. And it's in, oh, it's in, uh, it's still in beta testing as they've called it. So we haven't really rolled it out 
I think on to the, you know, all their customers, but we'll see. Yeah. It's promising uh, for something that I could grow into over the next few years. Um, I'll hit mine. It's more distribution centers. So they hinted about this on a call. They said they want to get one in the Northeast, I believe. I'm not sure where all their locations are right now, but they got that new one in Texas. So I think they have three. I think they have four. Four. They're in four states. Okay. So it's, I believe. Okay. So they have at least four. Um, if they got six or eight, you know, around that number around the country, there's a better chance of them getting that operating leverage that an e-commerce business can get that needs to get to a big enough scale to have uh, just geographically in the United States, you know, if that makes sense. And that could really help, you know, build out the value proposition, build out the competitive advantage. You really see the economies of scale of an e-commerce business when you get the distribution centers around the country, you get two day or one day shipping or whatever it is, like we've already talked about. Um, all right, let's move on to highlights and low lights. Ian, uh, what do you like about car parts? What, what don't you like? For me, it starts with the revenue growth. Um, it's been impressive over this last year since they started this turnaround and they believe they can hit 20 to 25% long-term revenue kager. Um, I don't know exactly what that means, whether that's five years or 10 years, but, um, it, they, they think there's a lot of revenue growth in the near future and the model makes sense to me. Um, I like the progress. I like the, the management team. Um, they also mentioned that about 30% of their revenue comes from repeat purchases. So presumably they're keeping their customers happy, which is always a good thing to see. As far as low lights, I'm not sure exactly what the long term looks like for this business and for the auto market more generally as a whole. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of change in the auto market going forward and whether that's electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, um, more public transportation options, whatever it is, there's just a lot of change coming up and they're trying to position themselves well for the electric vehicle transformation. They, they say that I think it's like 90% of the parts are the same, whether it's electric vehicles or traditional vehicles. Um, and it just expands their market a little bit to sell that, that different 10% of parts, but there just seems like there's enough uh, turmoil and transition going on in this market that it's going to be a little unclear what this market's going to look like five to 10 years from now. Yeah. EVs do bring simplicity to the table too. So there it's, it's a way simpler, um, just engine. Yeah. yeah like power. Yeah. Trend. I mean, yeah, yeah. The engine especially is a lot simpler. So that can mean less need for, uh, you know, replacement parts, but we'll see. And autonomous, uh, you know, that, that is a threat for sure. Um, and that's a looming one, but you could, it's a weird one that I think has made AutoZone. But don't, don't they like, just end up selling to the dealers at that point? I yeah. Guess? So the number is that like, you know, your people worry about the amount of cars on the road declining substantially by like 90%. But that's been a concern for the last decade when autonomous has been, you know, right around the corner, right around the corner. Everyone's saying that. So that is a looming threat, but it, it's too, I think it's probably early to tell too early to tell if that's going to be, you know, within the next three years or within a decade or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, what do you have? Uh, I guess the macro benefit of cars lasting longer uh, makes people want to upgrade more. Uh, and then some of the stuff we just talked about, which is there is a, some competitive advantage against the other online players uh, in the brand. And then there's the asset light scaling, which Ian talked about versus more the brick and mortar stuff. My low lights though, I'm actually not a huge fan of the economics. There's a reason that they have 34% gross margins. And I think a lot of that cost of goods sold is there to stay. I'm not sure there's that much operating leverage other than lower freight costs with extra distribution centers. But even then, you, you, this isn't a business that sits at like 70% gross margins at any point. Um, and then I guess from there, you say, what could the net margins be? And like the case in my mind is let's say five or 10%. Uh, They're guiding for 10%. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess that's just not something I'm overly optimistic about. And then I think I might've had the dilution part wrong, but they've. Uh, well, the past has been tough. They the had the equity. Re the thing that concerns me is they, it feels a bit malevolent to change the name to a dot com and then equity raise after your stock shot up. And then this, the old founder sold like 50% of his shares. That kind of threw me off. And I think that's what a lot of the short interest comes from. I think that's where, uh, cause I read a short report on Seeking Alpha that really talked about that a lot. And when they asked on the conference call, like, 
you know, shares outstanding jumped a lot randomly. He said, you know, 18 out of the 20 members on the executive team are new. And last year when we all joined, we didn't have the cash to pay them, which I guess is true. Um, and I don't know. I think the seller thing was probably what got me. If, if this is really yeah. a business that's going to be around for a long time and growing 20 to 25% CAGR, yeah, it's frustrating. Do you want it's to frustrating. Sell half your shares? Yeah, it's frustrating to see that. But the founders are gone, right? He's on and the board. He's on the board now. Yeah. Well, maybe. Uh, maybe I don't he's know. getting I don't know squeezed out. Maybe he's going to be gone. I mean, but he's been, he basically got squeezed out. You know, you. Yeah. If he got squeezed out, then maybe it's justification for him selling. But he's been on the board for three years. So I don't think he was selling until now. Well, I mean, stock went up what a thousand percent or eight hundred percent. So. I don't blame him, but it is frustrating. Yeah, it's stuff to watch out for, for sure. Yeah, I guess if new execs start selling, it's worth paying attention to. Yeah, and do watch the, the option grants. They're fairly heavy. So that's going to that's gonna happen. Yeah. There, um, I, got, I guess another potential low light, there is, an insane, there is not an insane amount of liquidity. Uh, I think this year might have been an anomaly, but minus $30 million in free cash flow for the year. Uh, right now they have, what, $30 million in cash waiting on the balance sheet? Is that yeah. Uh, they might I, have I don't to remember. raise again. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but yeah, it's a little more like forty-five million. But, um, okay. but still, like if they ha- if they were going to continue to have um, some years like that, they definitely have to raise equity. Yeah, and then yeah, one thing that could counteract that is I believe the Texas distribution center was only at sixty percent capacity. So if they just grow revenue by about 10, 20% from here on a quarterly basis, um, that would probably counteract that and make the cash flow dynamics a little bit better, but they do have to keep growing. If they keep building out these distribution centers, you, you gotta keep growing. Uh, so that, yeah, that is a concern. What do you um, have? Uh, yeah, I'll hit mine. I mean, either economics are sound, you know, as my, Ryan mentioned, we're not gonna be seeing high cash flow margins here for sure, but they're, I think they make sense. This isn't like something like, uh, Uber, I guess, or, or Lyft, where you're like, man, how are they ever going to make any money? Uh, they have a better value proposition, I think, versus the offline competitors, if they can get the distribution and sourcing correct and the delivery times correct. Um, and I think the mechanic connector thing, I don't know what to call it. You guys, I think you guys understand what I'm saying there. The Mechanic mobile. Mechanic mobile. I don't know what their name is going to be. Is that the name or no? They call them mobile mechanics. Mobile I mechanics. do question... I do question what the margins are like on that though. And how, like, what do the economics look like for car parts? Yeah. If it's like partnering with another auto body or something. I don't know. You pay, I mean, you pay up to get your car fixed. So I, I don't think it can be that bad, but it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be super high. Yeah. Uh, I just think that value proposition is really strong. Um, that increases the market to people like us that aren't car experts. Low lights though, at first glance, I worry about the, long-term viability of the auto repair market so, because EVs have simpler engineering. Um, and then there's also a threat that someone like AutoZone or O'Reilly can replicate this model. It would take a few years for sure uh, to do it. You know what I mean? Like, what would, make, AutoZone it, what or would O'Reilly, make it tough for them? Well, you have to get a million, um, like Just the, the, the database going, you have to do that. You have to work out. I mean, kind of think about it, how Target, and Walmart, it took them, you know, three, five years to turn that around. You know, no. it just takes a while to build out something like this, but they can do it. They have the, for sure. Yeah. I I would rather be in that position, I think, as a shareholder where it's building out the database than it building out the footprint. Yeah. It's, I think it's harder than it looks, though. Yeah. It's definitely tough. Um, and then I also don't like how 35% of their sales are not coming from carparts.com. I think that number, um, it's kind of hidden in the 10K, but seeing that number track down over time is going to be important because- I think it has been. Yeah. Okay. That's good then. Uh, you know, if they're just selling on Amazon and eBay, I mean, what kind of business is this? I don't know. But overall, see, things seem solid. There, I think there's a lot to like. Fuel low lights as well. Um, all right. To wrap things up, more or less interested in- I think I know because this was your pick, but uh, I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I'd say it's probably only, I'm slightly more interested. Um, I think the model's interesting. I think what you guys pointed out about uh, the mobile mechanics, and we really have talked about that quite a bit in the last few minutes. I think that's 
potentially a big part of this business for him and maybe the main part of this business going forward. Um, but the big question for me is would I rather just on that piggybacking on the discussion you were just having is would I rather own this company trying to build out the distribution centers and the footprint, or would I rather own something like AutoZone that has a, has a track record of generating cash flow, of um, buying back shares and who I believe could innovate and really start taking a big chunk of this market like a Target or Walmart has done. So because because carparts.com, as much as we were joking about it earlier, they are not the Amazon. They are not the dominant player in selling um, car parts around the world. And so for it, it seems like me for a company like AutoZone that has over a billion dollars in cash on the balance sheet, um, that there'd be some possibility for them to really come into this market in a big way. And um, that's that's going to be the big question for me over the next couple of weeks as I look into this more. Um, do I want to own AutoZone or do I want to own car parts? Because I like the market. Yeah, and I think AutoZone is a perfect acquisition. Or sorry, car parts is a perfect acquisition target for AutoZone. Quite, yeah, that take quite the leverage. The uh, yeah, the well, I don't know how much they just stop the the buybacks for a year and then buy and then buy them out. You know? No, I meant car parts buying AutoZone. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. That would uh, that would be quite the LBO. Yeah, I don't think that will be happening anytime soon. But that combination could be promising. But yeah, that, that, that is something to watch out for. Uh, Ryan, what are your thoughts? I'm going to go less interested. Uh, I guess it's not a cars and auto in general isn't an area that I'm particular, particularly excited about, nor do I think I have any sort of edge in it. Um, and then the valuation, if they are successful, looks okay, but uh, it it's not dirt cheap. Yeah, Ian. And I'd just point out too, I meant to say this earlier, but it's gone up 15 times in the last year about. Um, this stock is not gonna go up 15 times in the next year. I'm pretty confident saying that. Uh, I think that's a think, good bet. Yeah, I think investors sometimes, especially on Twitter, we start seeing a stock like this that goes up so much and you you start thinking, oh, it's gonna continue just shooting up, shooting up, shooting up. But this was a stock that was priced almost like it was going bankrupt. Uh, yeah. prior to this to this growth and now it's being priced like a company that has some moderate growth potential so um expecting a 15x on this in the next year is is you shouldn't be investing in this because you're looking forward to do in the next year what it did in the past year yeah and just looking at that if people want to kind of because they don't really have the profits right now if you're looking at the price to gross profit around 4.5 and you think that they're going to have any sort of profit margins of around 10 percent um i don't know that i mean you're probably looking at right now in between something around 20, 20, 20, 30, you know, and times that, earnings, which and that's theoretical. Any, yeah, it's theoretical. They still got to execute. There's dilution coming in. Um, so yeah. Yeah. What about you? Are you interested? Uh, I'm slightly more interested. I like the business model. I worry about counter positioning from someone like, you know, other players in the space. Um, valuation isn't great. Versus like, if you look at the valuation, if this was a good business, if this was a really good business, you'd be like, oh, valuation is not bad. You know, if it's someone you're super confident in, right. But you're betting on someone where there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I don't know. This could, the mar I don't know, the market's large to go after. Uh, the auto part after market has been historically a fairly solid business compared to the actual automotive industry. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm slightly more interested. Definitely going on the watch list, but there are some concerns with this business for sure. Okay, what's your stock for next week? Okay, we're going to be sticking with the car. It's not even the car industry, but we're going to be doing Formula One. Very exciting. Nice. Monty, not Monty, Monaco is this weekend. The big <laughs> Monte <race>. Carlo. <laughs> Monaco is the big race this weekend. Uh, while we're recording, it'll be a little farther down the road when we actually release the Formula One. One, but yeah, exciting. I'm going to give you guys some easy homework. All right. You have to watch, at least start the uh, Netflix documentary. What race? Drive to, to, survive. Drive to survive. Yeah, it's good. I don't know, but uh, at least start it. You know, I'm not going to make you watch the whole series, but that kind of, <laughs> you know, right. easy homework for you. But uh, that, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you all for listening. Make sure, or sorry, remember, we are not financial advisors. Anything we say on the show is not formal advice or recommendation. Ryan and I are general partners at Arch Capital. Arch Capital clients may hold securities discussed in this podcast. Thank you all for listening. 
ご支援したい。